Dude, this is like the hardest subject. Yeah. This is so hard. Why is it hard? Because there's a fine line between art and design and how we use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, illustration is right at the middle. Welcome to The Google Method, a podcast exploring the design stories behind Google products and experiences. I'm your host, Travis Nielsen, and in this episode, you'll hear from a trio of designers working right at the middle of art and design. I'm talking about illustration. From playful onboarding animations to product icons and even Google Doodles, illustration is one of the key ways that Google communicates its personality to the world. First up, we'll be talking to Matt Helm, who wrote the Google Rulebook for illustrators. Thanks, Travis. And Laura Dimitru, an illustrator and motion designer who crafted the new Pixel onboarding animations. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So, Matt, what makes a good illustration? Um, immediate comprehension. Such a hard question. No, I, I, <laughs> I like that answer because it really shows the way that you approach this work. So you're a product illustrator. The illustrations that you create and help others to create have a very specific purpose, and yes. that's to understand what's happening. Yeah. Product illustration is intended to do what the copy or other forms of content can't. So... A good product illustration is immediate user comprehension. That's typically how we rate it as far as being successful. Yeah, and I noticed in the spec that you have principles about what makes that illustration immediately comprehensible. The illustration should always have a purpose. Yeah. Explain that. Are we just talking about like it can't be decoration? or So the principles that we've honed in on for product illustration are all measurable. We're able to prove that it's successful. So being purposeful, we're able to do that by doing testing around user comprehension. So a good illustration is immediately understood. What's the process of going and writing the spec, the rule book by which to judge illustration? Where do you start? Oh God, I don't know. It's basically a reverse engineered project or program. We did an audit on, I believe, 19 products to see where we are at in comparison within the whole ecosystem. It was about 620 illustrations. And then from there, it's just trying to get an idea of not only where you're at, but where you want to go, like what's missing. So you have to create a lot of, or examine a lot of what's wrong to figure out what's right. So when you were doing the audit, was there anything that just like really stood out oh, as yeah. like both a good example and the kind of like a way out there example? I think the biggest thing that came out of it was when to use illustration. Statistically, I don't, I don't remember the percentage, but it was probably a good 40% use cases where we didn't need illustration, where it was assumed that the illustration would improve the experience. In reality, it just created more things for the user to look at, which ended up being an issue. There was two areas where the use and application of were super disconnected and it was around color usage and people in hands. People in hands? Yes. What do you mean? So how we were using people in hands was very dynamic across the whole set. <laughs> that sounds like a careful word. Yeah, <laughs> it is. What's the significance of people in hands? Actually, here's a, here's a broader question. Why would we want to use illustration over another type of imagery like photography or something else? Well, there's a number of reasons, but, but one of those is where copy can't communicate as quick. I mean, illustration and copy are the same thing. If you have a ton of copy and you're trying to drive the eye through it in a fluid way, you can use illustration to do that. N not all cases, but it is a solution. It's kind of like food. You're able to mix certain ingredients to get a specific outcome. I make a lot of food analogies. <laughs> I like food. <laughs> Who doesn't? I could say that um, it's also very, it's a bit of a competition sometimes between uh, illustration and copy because we've we've done some user testing with where we had like animations and copy or like even like some titles and stuff. And a lot of the times people just don't read it. If you have animation there, then they just don't read anything anymore. So it's also something that we always need to be careful with. Oh, that it can just, be overbearing. Ooh. It can be distracting. That legal, that legal copy. 
Urgesh. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. I didn't read it. There was something spinning above it. Yeah, well, and that's what we're looking at here with Laura's work. Yeah. Like, it's super hard because that has to be there. So how do you make that digestible and, and understood immediately and in such a way that you're okay with it? All right. So Laura, let's talk about your work for just a little bit. So we have an illustration that we've been looking at together. It's a setup flow for the pixel. And yeah. this is a podcast. I'll just try to my best to describe it. But it's really cool. It's <laughs> got this search magnifying glass, which is like an iconic search metaphor. And then all of these shapes are pivoting around. And they're just like these arbitrary shapes, like a pill shape, a triangle, a square. But as these rough primitive shapes pass under the magnifying glass, they transform into very specific iconography, like a chat bubble or a photograph or a file folder. Tell me about this illustration. What is it meant to communicate? How did you start? What did not work? And how did you end up here? So this illustration has a bit of a background because this is part of the new Pixel setup flow. And when I started working on this project, it was two years ago before the Pixel was launched. So we were very brand new with this. So we were just experimenting and defining the style. And somebody will see this when they're setting up their phone for the first time, right? Yes. That's the context? Uh, okay. Exactly. And there are some like different needs here that we need to have a um, consistent style throughout the whole journey because it's a whole flow. It, it takes a while to set up everything. And we also kind of need to make sure we communicate to the user. They need to understand what's happening at the moment. And of course, people don't always read everything that's on the screen. So an illustration is a bit more helpful to communicate something simple. But it can be very tricky to say what exactly you need to say. So this one was about analyzing the, your data and seeing like what we can restore from your previous phone. So we wanted to have a nice way to show that there's some particular things that you would like on your new phone. And then these things were analyzing and seeing if we can copy them. And in an interaction model with the user, this mm -hmm. illustration kind of functions as a progress bar or a spinner. I'm looking at it right now, <laughs> and we'll try to put it on the website so people listening can check it out. But I'm looking at it right now, and it's, it's kind of mesmerizing. I'm like, <laughs> what icon will this triangle turn into? What about this square? Oh, it's a gear. <laughs> you know, like, so not only does it help the user understand that things are happening in the background and we're waiting, but it also is it's very entertaining and makes me feel content a little bit <laughs> in uh, discovering what's going to happen next in the illustration. Yeah, because this process can take either very little time or very long time. So it's kind of nice to have this moment of delight for the user to have an illustration to be entertained and while waiting. That's exactly the purpose it serves. Laura, I want to ask you another question. What makes this illustration googly? So I think it's a lot about like the visual style itself. You know, when you think about Google, you have like this clean web page. So it's about this idea of building from white and then using the Google colors in a meaningful way. So this is why the icons, when they become visible, they have this color. And it also has this thing about being neutral. Like it's not trying to take over the whole screen or it's not trying to grab all the attention to itself. It's just being there to soothe you in. <laughs> I think it's like a simplicity and just like having a very direct single message about it. I think this goes back to like the principle stuff. So all of the product illustration principles are created to be measurable, but the principles themselves are based off of an article by Jess Holbrook called principles, not platitudes. Okay. But the idea that they're measurable. So by defining those specific areas and then measuring those, you're able to do that. So when we say googly, what is that? Yeah. How is that successful? Or how are you going to achieve that? And it all comes down to how you define it. Right. Our, our metric for measuring googly is googliness. So yeah, <laughs> what's the nest? What, what, no, no, what's that's, no, it's nest? quantifiable. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> when I think of Google's voice and brand, mm -hmm. somebody once told me it was um, your your fun but smart friend. Ooh, that's good. And that's not official or anything. But do you have one of those? Do I have a fun and smart friend? Yeah, sitting across the microphone oh, from me. What? Hey. <laughs> but yeah, and and I think that the illustrations that that 
that you've specced and that Laura and other great illustrators are doing to help us just communicate that. And going back to what you said, what makes a good illustration is making it communicative. That metric of Googliness is hard to nail down, but I can intuitively see it in the work that you do. This is really great. Thanks a lot for sitting with me today, Matt, Laura. This has been really informative. I feel like I kind of want to go sketch some stuff now. But yeah, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, we're not done yet. So Matt and Laura's work ends up in Google products like Pixel or Drive. But when most people think about Google and illustration, their brain goes to one thing. I'm talking about doodles. So Helene, what makes a doodle really googly? I would think the thing that makes a doodle really googly is the emotional connection with the user. That's Helene LaRue, the artist behind Google's first Emmy-nominated doodle called Back to the Moon. The animated short tells the story of the French film director Georges Millier, showing him in this magical world of playing cards, underwater adventures, sword duels, and an iconic crash landing straight into the moon. And so for the rest of the podcast, we're going to be talking to Helene, and she's going to take us behind the scenes into how this doodle came to be. Bring a lot of fun to the brand. Helene, how was this illustration subject chosen? So the subject of George Melies was chosen, I think it was last summer. Uh, to give a bit of context, every, every year we can pitch a lot of ideas, and uh, the team has meeting regularly on, in the summer to choose all the subjects that are submitted. Who's uh, pitching? Is it all the illustrators? So anybody in the world can pitch. And, uh, well, the doodlers are required, of course, regularly to, to pitch ideas for themes. And uh, George Melies is an idea I had for a long time. I grew up with his films. I mean, some of his films, were, as I made more research, I realized he did more than 500 films. I maybe knew like two or three, but the, the guy is a genius. So yeah, it was always in the back of my mind, this idea with the moon and the bullet and the eye was so iconic to me. And a lot of people thought it would be a shame not to represent him in a, in a doodle. And uh, turns out, as I made more research, I just realized how much he was the pioneer of visual effects in cinema. And it was, it was way too important not to talk about it. Right. So you're doing a lot of research to get started. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When the pencil hits the paper, what does that look like? Are you doing a lot of sketching? It's or? first a lot of writing, a lot of keywords. It's like, OK, you have to answer. Why is the subject important? Why is it important for Google? Why is it important for the Doodle team? Why is it important for the user? So it's really listing all these elements. And George Melies, as a cinematographer, invented his own camera to film his own films. Just to give a quick history, before him came the Lumiere brothers, who was actually invented the camera to record. But all of the films that they did was only documentary. They would film people coming out of work, like the train coming in the station. And what Melias brought was, well, I'm going to put story into that and mm-hmm. magic into that and have people dream with what they see. So he was a magician before being a filmmaker, Melias. So he really wanted to bring all this magic and theatrical effect into the film that he did. And by making his own camera, came up with a lot of visual tricks uh, that is still used today in the film industry. So, Did that influence how you went about creating the storyboards and illustrations? Oh, yes. Melias was a pioneer in the way he approached films. And I we thought the best way of honoring him was to use the latest technology we had available today to be able to recreate a little story around the films that he did. We always try and find new technologies to express stories and ideas. Uh, I think that's a very important thing that we need to develop because there's so many yeah, technical ways we could do it. And it's all about exploration and how finding new ways of expressing things. And it's fascinating. Well, what specific technologies inspired or elevated your work this time? So, yeah, that was the next step to contact Google Spotlight Stories. I've known their work for a while. I think they've been doing a little short film for five years. I don't know if you've seen them. They had a, an amazing uh, collection of different styles and little stories that is just magical to look at. Like when you put the headsets, you're pushed in a, in a world completely. And uh, It's I, a, the VR stories. The is, VR that's stories. That's what Spotlight says, right? Yeah, yeah. They're special, specialized in short VR stories. And that was wonderful because Melias, when he made his film, he just wanted the audience to be fully immersed in this world. So what's better than just put a headset and completely be 
in a on a, in another world. Right. So. Um, was were there some early ideas that you had that were different than what the final was? Well. I had the story idea from the beginning. I thought maybe I would make a little short film. Uh, the idea of having the little characters in the toy shop, because I don't know if people know, uh, Melies got broke uh, at a at a point in his life, and it was very sad. He had to sell toys in a station in uh, in Paris, and I wanted to give an homage to him by rebringing life to all the toys that he created. And so I developed this story with like little toy Melies and, and little toy queen and trying to find ideas and tricks of magic like through toy level scale. Uh, so the whole story was already kind of there. And then we just pushed it a step further by making, wait a minute, we could like transform like be the scale of a toy in a world. Uh, we, we thought it was interesting to play with VR for that, uh, to be immersed in the world where the scale is completely different. That's so awesome. <laughs> um, what were the challenges you ran into as you were developing this? There was a lot of technical challenges, but the first main one I bumped into was creating the storyboard for it because unlike normal films and animations, they're is no frame anymore. So how do you storyboard a story with no frame? I remember spending two days freaking out about how to approach this. And then uh, I started creating uh, little sketches of the whole background and putting the camera in the middle and in perspective, trying to figure out where the elements were. And I started decomposing the story in three specific layers, having the main story always kind of in front of you so that it would be easy to follow. And then since the viewer can see like 360 around him, uh, trying to have layers of, oh, maybe secondary actions in the back or, or the sides for people who want to start exploring. And then third actions in the back where it's a little less lit. But for people who, who like looking around, like can find like amusing little animation loops and stories. Mm -hmm. So it's really about a strong construction of the story and then work around that. I understand there was also not just the the depth of the visuals that you're working with, but also there was also nuances in when to progress the user or the viewer through the story. Like there would be pauses depending on where they were uh. looking. Yes. Well, we created in total maybe five different versions of the film. The one you're mentioning is the Google Spotlight Story app one, where they developed this interactive component to the stories where, in fact, yes, when you follow the main story, it keeps going. But then if you decide, like in the middle of it, to go explore in the back, then the main story will pause and wait for you as you look around. And that is pretty crazy. It was a lot of uh, difficulty to have the music flowing around that because you can oh, wow. you cannot have a clear cut in the yeah. music and be like, oh, like get silence when you look around. No, it was always finding ways of like putting everything together to feel like nothing's stopping and it's you don't realize it. Speaking of the music, you collaborated with a lot of people to make this project. Yes. Um, we talked about Google Spotlight, but also for the music, you collaborated with the London Symphony? Yes, the London Symphony Orchestra. So we worked with, a, oh, just to mention, I worked in the Nexus studio in London. We collaborated with them. I was in London back when this happened, and a Google Spotlight Story had already worked with this Nexus studio on a previous project. And so they put me in touch with them again, where I met when I co-directed there with another uh, director that I knew very well from, from my previous jobs, FX Gobi. And together, yes, we, we brought the whole thing to life and collaborated with like 20 people, that um, 3D artists, technical artists. And then this one composer that we both knew, Mathieu Alvado, who is French. We're all French in is the Is that team. right? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's fitting. <laughs> yes, I that's guess. Awesome. We had to pick French people. <laughs> so Mathieu Alvado was, uh, was amazing. It was great to collaborate with him. He got us in contact with the London Symphony Orchestra and we all went there for the recording session, which was yeah, amazing. I have no other word. No, I, I saw some films. There's a oh, video on YouTube, yes. and and I watched it. And I was like, I was like, I didn't realize the scale oh, of yeah. effort and collaboration that went into this. Oh yeah, we wanted a really, how do you say, real touch, not like electronic music, but like really, I don't know, all like the not words. digital, yeah, like, we, like very physical. Yes, that's why we like hired a whole orchestra to to, to play it. Because when you have the music in your head in the VR world, you want it to to sound perfect. Mm -hmm. So you, you have 
a lot of, of effort and a lot of um, stakeholders and collaborators going into this. I'm curious about how do you make sure that you're going in the right direction? Uh, were there any like usability tests? tests? We had people coming like where we were in Nexus Studio, they have a whole team of people working there. So they would always ask a new person to come and try it to mm. see where they would look. And then we would accordingly like maybe bring more light to the main scene to have the viewer be more guided to go there. Yeah, it's always interesting to see where people decide to look. Some people would come and follow the main story perfectly, and some others will try and find every little detail in the backgrounds that we would have missed. So it's a very different approach. It was it was interesting to see where they were looking. Yeah, I, I know there was a lot of details that you put in, yeah. into like all the artifacts, the components that build up the story. What was your favorite detail that maybe we might have missed? No, well, I don't want to reveal too much for people who, who haven't <laughs> seen it, but you should definitely check out the musician in the back they're not having a good time through the whole process <laughs> but they're really funny and also I added a poster of the team in the back for people who really looked at that's a fun Easter egg yeah I that was our Easter egg I wanted the whole team to be in the project basically yeah. and uh, I based it on like some of Melius's old poster projects when he would hire like a whole group of dancers to come and play in his films so I put every single person in a tutu dress uh, <laughs> on the poster and I put it in the back. Um, I saw also there was this reference to something called unnecessary gestures. I think it was the director uh, talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, FX, yes. Can you tell me about why that would be something that was consciously decided upon? And what they are. What What is an unnecessary... Unnecessary gesture. Ah, it's hard because, like, <laughs> it's not filmed. Uh, it's what a lot of artists perform on stage they have to be very clear and visible from if you sit in the back of the room on a theater stage like you have to be sure that the gesture is really well understood mm -hmm. so melias was a theater man a showman before that so he would always emphasize his gesture to explain um his action yeah so and if he's on the stage and he's pointing to something he's yeah gonna, exactly he's gonna flail his arms about a little bit yeah, and exactly. then land it would also What's the word? Before you do something, you build up to it. What's the word? Like anticipation? Anticipation. There okay. you go. Okay. So yeah. he would do these things to build the anticipation of the viewer and to get them excited. Uh -huh. So we really wanted to show that in the film. And also, because it's a toy scale and in VR, we needed the actions to be very, very clear so people would follow the story way easier because it's not a set frame. So if you want the viewer to follow the main story, you had to give them like big actions to follow. Mm -hmm. so. And there was a lot of other details like uh, maybe like in their outfits or their expressions. Like can you ah. tell me? So I was in charge of uh, the designs of the project. And again, we wanted to keep it very simple so that it was well understood when you follow the story. When you look at the design, it has very simple shapes like a circle for the head or stick arms and, and things like that. And uh, what I thought was very important was to keep very big eyes so that you could follow the expression very clearly. And also, because, again, it is a, a toy scale world, we couldn't add too many details. Otherwise, it would it would feel like the scale wouldn't fit anymore if you had like, mm -hmm. little tiny hands or something like that. So we try to sort of keep the roughness of a toy. What was the most difficult part about that? For the design? Oh, but it's the best part of a project, the design. I didn't find it difficult. I just loved, oh, no, creating the color, the textures. We wanted to keep a very handmade approach to it because... I don't know if you know, Melias painted all of his sets, his assets, everything. So I wanted to keep that painterly feeling to it. And the 3D team had made an amazing job at just reproducing those designs in 3D. I would work hand in hand with them. I would like draw over their design to be like, no, this, this eye has to be bigger. The mustache is a little pointier or <laughs> things like that. It was a very organic approach has a lot of dialogue and communication. And it, it turned out great. I was just impressed of all the 3D that they've that they've built. Right. We're going to talk in a moment about the nomination, but before we do that, I was thinking that maybe I could get a little clip of you describing the film. It's about magic. It's about romance. <laughs> it's about rescuing the love of your life. <laughs> I don't know. And fight the enemy. I love it. All the classic, like, you know, story basics. <laughs> we wanted to keep it very simple. Yeah. I, I love that description because you know, given the context of our conversation, talking about like the technical and the journey of creating it, sometimes we lose that, like what's the heart of this 
story about. Mm, the emotional and, connection. Yeah, you just brought it right back in there. It, <laughs> it's about magic and romance and fighting for what you love. And well, yeah. yeah. It's all that matters in movies, right? Uh, oh, that's beautiful. Stories. <laughs> so this is a really exciting project, not just for you, but for Google. Like, we're, we're all very happy, very proud of you. Mm. And in the whole team, what you guys have done. Oh, yeah. And the film is nominated for an Emmy. Yes hard to believe. But. How did you find out about that? Or like, what was that like to learn? We found out through Google Spotlight Stories. So we got an email. I remember coming one morning, just like going to meetings and stuff. And while listening to the meeting, having this email being like, oh, by the way, you're nominated for an Emmy. It's like, what? What? <laughs> and then I started to have people around be like, oh, my God. And it's like, what? It's. I feel it's just surreal. Like, it doesn't really hit you. You're like, oh, <laughs> Um, okay, this is like, it took me, I, I still don't believe it. We're going, we're flying to LA tomorrow uh, to the ceremony and I'm not, I'm still not believing it. Awesome. Well, I hope that you do really well at the, at the awards. Thank we're all you. very excited for you. Well, it's fine. We're only competing against what, NASA, Pixar, uh, Disney, Marvel, <laughs> <laughs> and they've made like this whole VR games. Um, so I don't know. We have this little two minute <laughs> film. I think that's even more compelling. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. We'll, we'll see tomorrow. All right. Well, good luck. And thanks for stopping Thank by you. the studio. Thank you so much for taking time too. Well, folks, the results are in, and the Emmy didn't end up going to Helene and her team, but something tells me that this isn't going to set them back. As always, you can find more information on the things we talk about in the show notes at design.google slash podcasts. This episode was recorded and edited by Brian Gordon and produced by Barbara Eldridge. The artwork you see for each episode is created by Skip Hirsch. Subscribe to the show on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like the episode, please leave a review as it helps new listeners to find the show and gives us something to read at night. All right, that's it from us. I see the guy walking. What? Just a person come down of a car? Huh? Huh? Now I'm underwater. What? The princess is a mermaid and he is just a scuba diver. Ah, the little green guy come down. The little green guy has a tutu on, and the prince has a mug suit on. <gasps> the little green guy has a pair of ill kiss. Ooh. Huh? Oh. Where am I going? Huh? <gasps> ah, it's done. It's done. My favorite part is when the green guy showed up because it was funny.